Right, it's great. Thank you. So hello, everybody. And now to something completely different, because I saw most, if not all, the talks from the morning. And uh, we're going to take a tour uh, to somewhere a bit different, a bit back to basics about uh, APIs, protocols, remote operations, with emphasis on, uh, on the Microsoft Windows environment, but still. Uh, so every admin tool is an attack tool, right? Uh, every, whether it's a remote management operation or uh, an adversary lateral movement, that's all about context. Context is everything. And today we are going to explore and show you some uh, pretty nice uh, 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 tricks and, and things you should be aware of uh, when it comes to uh, moving laterally inside networks uh, for both uh, red teamers as well as blue teamers. So we have everything for everybody in the audience. And before we start, how many of you are defining themselves more as a red teamer? or with an adversary mindset? Okay, not too bad. And how many of you are more of blue teamers, in a way? Well, interestingly enough, you sat in the two opposite sides of the room. <laughs> that's very cool. So all the red teamers are here and the blue teamers. That's very nice. I didn't plan that, but that, that's a nice coincidence. So a bit about myself. Um, I've been around with computers for a while. Uh, also I've been doing back in the years uh, some really extensive research. Today I'm more doing uh, red team training, uh, consulting to customers around the world, etc. Uh, I'm known for my work around the Hacktive Directory, uh, the, the Hacktive Directory guy. That's a technology I've, I've been around with for the third decade now, as well as working for Microsoft in, uh, in the times that it was uh, pretty much in the early years, early days of uh, Active Directory. Um, and essentially, uh, I'm a co-founder of uh, Tenroot, a uh, cybersecurity niche boutique company hailing from Israel. Um, as well as uh, in the Active Directory space, I was also with uh, some friends of mine from the Israeli Air Force and Intelligence Corps. We uh, established Javelin Networks, which we sold to Symantec, a deception solution around Active Directory back in 2018. And in my uh, spare time... Um, I'd love to volunteer in, in different uh, um, as communities uh, and play the guitar, play the buzu guitar, which is an instrument I invented. And if I get some more spare time, I can also fly around. Uh, I want to emphasize before we start that I did not use ChatGPT at all in the making of this presentation and code. And the reason is not that I didn't want to. I really, really tried hard. Uh, to get it not to be buggy. But the fact is that the technology still has uh, mileage to go, <laughs> sadly. Uh, because, you know, the, the bugs are the worst kind of bugs. They're logical bugs. So uh, no errors, but it's just completely wrong. <laughs> right? So, for example, here in uh, uh, this uh, example, I uh, looked for, I wanted it to save me some code that I know to write, but still. Uh, of bringing all the TGS, TGT authentication requests and uh, service uh, requests for Kerberos protocol for both success and failures, obviously for both types of tickets. And it flagged all the authentication tickets as success and all the service tickets as failure. And that is, of course, totally incorrect, but the code will work, just it will not be right. And then when I explain to it, the engine does the worst thing it can do, which is it protects its truth. So it just rewrites the code, <laughs> essentially rewriting the loop, but keeps the same bad logic, although I explained it very well. So maybe next year. What we'll talk about? We're going to talk quite a lot about uh, living off the land examples uh, and about the remoting mindsets, not only about the skill set and tool set, although we'll, we'll touch on both those as well. Uh, we're going to dive, uh, touch RDP, RPC, interpost communications, uh, sh reverse shell, shell code, partial, etc. But uh, the, most of the emphasis will be around partial remoting or Windows remote management, the web services management protocol that allows us to get uh, remote uh, shells uh, in Microsoft environment. Then we'll touch about how credentials are exposed uh, in remote operations. And we're going to do the fun thing of showing you why you should not trust Microsoft documentation, because it's just simply wrong. They tell you they don't expose, but they do, and we'll show you how. Uh, and uh, then uh, I'm going to show you some tricks to prevent lateral movement at all without using any third-party product. And of course, all along the road, tips, open source tools, Python, shell scripts, PowerShell. Uh, a word of advice to those of you that like love the G in GUI. Uh, we can drop the G in uh, this talk. We'll have some men in the middle stuff with RDP, but that's about it. So we're all CLI users. We love CLI. 
performance, security, everything is there. So to kick off with, uh, living off the land, probably a concept you've heard of. Obviously, the red team has heard of. For you, blue teamers, we want you to also keep you in the loop. Uh, it's essentially uh, using uh, the uh, tools, binaries, APIs, protocols, etc., that already exist in the operating system and in the customer environment, right? So you go to an organization, you don't want to deliberately introduce uh, malware, especially not early or at all. And to be honest, you can actually get all the way from a low preview user to a domain admin or significant persistence uh, with uh, just... Uh, living off the land tools for most environments with enough misconfigurations, excessive permissions, etc. And like I told you in the beginning, uh, we're, we're walking this fine line between remote management. Is that a legitimate uh, remote access uh, session and lateral movement? And the way to do that is by using multiple living off the land binaries, like multiple all bins that exist. Uh, RPC, obviously, remote procedure calls, essentially MSRPC, the Microsoft proprietary remote procedure calls, which we'll discuss in a minute. Although you might think you know it uh, well, we'll talk about some characteristic of it. Essentially, the implementations you see on the day-to-day -day are WMI, Windows Management Instrumentation, Microsoft implementation of WebM, Web-based enterprise management from the 90s, as well as DCOM, Distributed COM, Component Object Model, and the API Heaven, so-called, right? Uh, that we have in Windows, essentially dozens of protocols and APIs and objects that you can instantiate and work with that include remote calls and remote instantiation and invocation. RDP, how can we not uh, mention that? Uh, we'll touch that briefly, the remote desktop protocol. Uh, but like I said, we'll focus on uh, WinRM and partial remoting. So speaking about RPC, the Microsoft RPC essentially is a system service that is sort of an inter-process communications, like a low-level uh, inter-process mechanism. This means that it enables data exchange and invocation of functionality. This is actually the Microsoft or Wikipedia or Microsoft definition located in a different process. Now, normally you think about RPC as like this remote uh, protocol or whatever, but that's a mindset that we have to change. You should really look at it as exchanging data and invoking functionality on a different process. Now, that process can be on your same computer, exchanging data, like copy-paste, buffer, whatever. It can be a stager talking to a payload. It can be uh, on another uh, host in your uh, segment, in your LAN, or it can be on a remote network. And the RPC service itself is essentially the uh, service control manager for both a COM and distributed COM, essentially the remote uh, invocation of components and RPC uh, itself. And really many, many services depend on RPCs to work. Uh, I think more than you would imagine, if I enumerate the dependencies on the RPC subsystem service, I just put a larger buffer, so you will see all of them. Uh, this is like uh, uh, the latest Windows 10 uh, machine uh, with the latest update. So just look at the count of what we get back here. It's over 200 uh, dependent services on RPC subsystem. Obviously, can the hardening step of closing RPC will not work. Your operating system will not work. And this RPC subsystem essentially works with uh, those uh, protocols and ports. Uh, remember that the uh, dynamic ports, ephemeral ports on the higher range used to be back in the XP Windows 2003 era. They used to be different ports. So, But if you're working in a network that has all the main servers, domain controllers 2012 and above, or minimum 2008, and Windows Vista, so you should be okay with just those uh, 49152 up to 64 bit 65535. Um, and ports are something quite huge in private infrastructure in Microsoft. Just have a look at this, something I had to uh, create, compile, because Microsoft does not have this on their documentation. Uh, the active ports on an average domain controller, on an active directory domain. Uh, so how do you determine the ports, protocols that the tool uses? So obviously, uh, I can pop up uh, Wireshark and begin to analyze it, but there is probably a quicker way. Uh, and on the way, I want to show you also why pre-authentication matters, the way that pre-authentication happens, happens in remote management tools. So why not create a netstat loop? So let's do just that. Um, so in this case, I created a netstat loop using GetNetTCP connection, which is essentially an object-based netstat. 
Uh, and I filter all the remote management ports. Um, so RDP, uh, RPC, WinRM, etc. So this loop essentially runs uh, every second and refreshes the ports for known remote management uh, uh, protocols. Uh, and shows me the, the system, uh, the, the process name and the process ID, the PID in the, on the other side. So now when I open MSTSC, Microsoft Terminal Services Client, automatically you see, obviously no surprise here, port 3389, and immediately the port is established even before I uh, got a chance to put credentials. But what happens if I will run a WMI query? So here I'm running a WMI query on a remote host. You see automatically it's established on port 135, the RPC endpoint mapper, and Process ID 824 uh, on my local machine, right? Access was denied, so the action uh, failed, author authorization failed, but because of the authentication attempt, the port was triggered, and I can see that actually in my netstat loop. And obviously, if I will look for this uh, SVC host, the uh, process that hosts processes in Windows, because Windows performance in processes is so bad, that you have to cache uh, process creation. Uh, but uh, it's true. <laughs> but uh, if I use PowerShell and the action is failed, so uh, pay attention that there is no remote port, right? The, there is access denied, but I don't see any, uh, even no, um, not even time wait or, or any sync uh, request, etc. Because WinRM is a more mature protocol, the web services management protocol, it just drops uh, the request at the threshold. So you don't, if you're trying to build as a defender on uh, some uh, port uh, knowledge or logs, uh, you will be disappointed because you will not see failed attempts. And uh, now if I run it, I, I ran as a, a user that does have permissions, so you will not be denied access. But now I run uh, again this partial remoting with user that has permissions. And uh, now, and only now, when I will run this, then you will see the 5985 remote port uh, getting lit on the Netstat Christmas tree. And if we speak about inter-process communications, uh, this is actually a cool mechanism that you, you should all be aware of. Uh, red teamers especially, blue teamers, um, uh, we wish you good luck because this is essentially, uh, it's riding SMB, the server message blocks, the Microsoft file sharing. And you have hundreds of IPC, of, of uh, name pipes, uh, sorry, of name pipes running in your machine. And uh, this is a very cool mechanism because you can create a name pipe, both local and remote. You can create it one way, two way, encrypted, not encrypted. Everything is there to configure. And the most beautiful thing about it for adversaries is that I can run it, uh, I can actually create a very cool uh, reverse shell or, or full command and control uh, shell without needing to open a firewall port. I don't have to bind to a socket because I'm just writing an already uh, existing socket, so I don't even need permissions. So these messages from uh, Netcat and other tools that I try to access a higher port will never happen. And it's, again, very hard to detect because it's all uh, SMB traffic, 445. Uh, so let's see that. And this is a one-liner actually creating uh, this command and control channel, uh, totally blending in in your environment. We create a client stream, and then IEX executes the data, right? IEX is invoke expression. Essentially, it executes any string that I will send over to that client stream. And on another process, on the same machine, I'm just running as a different user, but same machine, I'm running uh, name pipes a uh, server stream. And when I write uh, to that buffer, to that stream, obviously everything I run here will get executed on the other side. So I have essentially a local uh, one-way named pipe uh, on my local machine. And for uh, the antivirus, EDR, all these blah, blah, endpoint protection games, nobody will uh, do anything for, for that uh, uh, process. Nobody will stop it because you have hundreds of those. Uh, Excel will fail to work. A lot of things will fail to work if they will try to do something to an A pipe they don't know. Uh, but now I'm just changing the client stream to an IP address. That's all I need to do. So I'm instantiating a new name pipe client stream, giving it a name, my pipe, uh, one way inside. I, it could be in, in and out, or just out. And from a different machine, I am now opening this server stream to that uh, pipe. And obviously now anything I run on this pipe will also get executed on the other side. So whether locally or remotely, uh, totally uh, under the radar for uh, endpoint protection, etc. Speaking of uh, working remotely in networks, 
Uh, obviously, you know those uh, errors, RPC not available, blah, blah, uh, and Kerberos is an authentication protocol where, where clocks can get skewed. So more than five minutes, uh, the authentication will fail and you won't get Kerberos protocol. So I want to show you a very quick tip on how to fix Kerberos clock issues remotely. You don't have to uh, wait for the next roll of uh, GPO or uh, whatever. You can do that either with WMI, with create process uh, downfall to NTLM. You know that when you access with an IP address, you will down, downfall to NTLM. Uh, and I will show you that with WinRM in this example, but both are exactly the same. So when you have clock skew issues, this, this will not work, right? I'm trying to access a share on that machine. It will tell me extended error happened. If I will try on that machine that is the remote machine, uh, which is win8.pc uh, in this case, it will tell me the server, the RPC server is not available. What you would think is this machine is not available, right? And it's, uh, even ping will fail with the same error, but it's not true. Uh, the computer is lying to you, as they do. Uh, when you try WinRM, okay, this message is a bit more uh, accurate. It tells you there's a time difference between client and the server. Thank you. You see what uh, 15, uh, 20 years of engineering between technologies do? The, uh, the messages are clearer. So now I will put uh, into a local variable my own time, the correct time. And the beauty about uh, PowerShell WinRM, PS Remoting, is that I can actually invoke a remote command and uh, send it to the IP address, uh, choose authentication negotiate, which is NTLM, and I can use this uh, nice uh, trick of uh, dollar using, which is a casting local variables to remote sessions. And in this way, I am going to run an NTLM uh, authenticated remote uh, CLI invoke and forget. So it just set the clock on that machine remotely in NTLM, and obviously the minute I did that, everything is back working. So I can access that machine and everything is good. Let's speak a bit about remote uh, ransomware, sorry, deployment uh, <laughs> protocol. Uh, we all know that uh, <laughs> opening RDP servers in the internet is no, no, it's bad, 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 but still Showdown is full of people that come to conferences and still uh, we see RDP servers exposed. And, you know, it's, it's really the Windows fav uh, admin favorite tool, right? IT cannot live without this tool. And there are multiple attacks, uh, attack vectors and tools out there. Uh, it's an, a port for authentication a protocol and enumeration of users, etc. So you can actually brute force it, try to change the default user as well as the default port as, as, a, as a tip for that. But there are multiple tools that you can actually achieve uh, uh, control of the session without the other side, the victim, knowing that you actually uh, have interfered with their session. And I want to show you a quick example of uh, a shell script that allows you to, there are other tools that can do similar things, uh, that allows you to do a man in the middle in an RDP in, in a customer environment. Essentially, the beauty about this attack is that you, at minimum, you get the net NTLM, the network NTLM that you can take offline and crack using Hashcat. Uh, but you can actually get uh, the clear text password as well if network level authentication uh, is not used. So in this case, I'm, I'm popping up the, the command on, uh, on my Linux box. And on the other side, uh, there is the victim. The victim is trying to connect uh, to a domain controller uh, and gets the user experience that he would expect. You can see something is already happening on the left side window. And what is happening as the victim is trying to access, you can see it's uh, uh, downgrading the session to RC4 instead of AES. And the downgrade of the session level not only downgrades the encryption, it also allows us to fake the certificate. We try to uh, attempt a CRED SSP. And why do we want to do CRED SSP, Credential Security Provider? Because it's delegation with clear text. Uh, this is a very bad delegation protocol in Windows. And you can see, first of all, we got the net NTLM. This you will get from any RDP connection in the network, which I remind you, we're not, we're not running mimicats, nothing, and the victim does not know that we are trying something at all, but we already get a hash like Kerber hosting, et cetera, that we can... Uh, hack offline. This is a fake certificate. It's not the real certificate, but because RDP connections are using self-signed certificate, the victim is not aware at all. And, and show me one person in the room that uses uh, server uh, authentication certificates and not self-signed. So you will see once we have this fake certificate, we have the clear text because uh, it's not the real certificate. It's 
unbelievably uh, simple and it's, it's just mind blowing that it still works in networks. But the clear text thing is happening only when network level authentication is disabled. Luckily for us red teamers, uh, it's just a registry key away. Obviously you have to be on the machine to set this registry key, but you don't have to be on the machine to set this registry key, right? Uh, you can use uh, ways like uh, to relay and redirect this traffic using Invey, Responder, tools like that. Uh, this side of the room know, knows what I'm talking about. Uh, and this is actually cool because you can uh, uh, either uh, change this directly or just run this PowerShell command to flip this uh, uh, network level authentication to off. And if you're not monitoring this uh, registry key uh, change, then any RDP server, including the latest, uh, will get clear text from the network. This is way more stealthier, silent, quicker than running Mimikets or any tools. There is no binary running on the remote server. So this begs the, the question, to admin or not to admin? That is the real question, right? Versus does all these uh, uh, techniques, can we even trust anything that's coming out in our network? And this is what I'm showing you, trust me, it's the tip of the iceberg. There is a five days training just on this topic, shortened to 45 intense minutes. So I would not trust my network, but I would start with this. So you prefer to work, most Windows admins prefer to work with RDP, uh, WMI access over RPC DCOM, backslash backslash some admin dollar, C dollar shares, PS exec uh, name pipes over R R RDP, uh, SMB, etc. But they overlook uh, a remote built-in uh, sh uh, shell, CLI. It does, it's, it's always encrypted, although it's HTTP, it encrypts all the traffic using your TGS, your t a ticket granting service, your session key works on a single port rather than this whole huge uh, party Swiss cheese on the firewall with RPC, etc. It does all of the above and much, 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 much more. So PowerShell remoting essentially is uh, maybe the thing that helped me stay on the Windows platform in a way. Well, my customers use Windows, so I have to anyway, if I, even if I don't want to. But PowerShell remoting really gives some hope to Windows admins that really want to admin something. Because management experience was very bad in Microsoft for many years. And uh, PowerShell remoting is done through uh, web services management. Essentially, it's SOAP using XML, right? Uh, and it's by default HTTP, although encrypted. You can also, and you should, use HTTPS in a workgroup or when using an uh, NTLM between machines outside of the domain. It's enabled by default on Windows Server 2012 and above, but on all other uh, operating systems, you need to enable it. And there is also uh, uh, a service called PowerShell Web Access, which is essentially uh, exactly what it sounds. You do, it's a clientless shell. It works from the browser. Every browser that supports JavaScript and cookies, Safari, uh, whatever, Mozilla, from your Linux or Mac box, uh, Mac OS box, you can actually uh, manage Microsoft servers uh, directly from your browser. It's sort of a browser-based jump server, which is really cool, and you should try it. But the architecture is very simple. You have the uh, listener. WinRM, Windows Remote Management, is running the show. This is a service that exists from Windows Vista and afterwards, Windows 7 for uh, most of the people. Um, and then it, when the request comes in, if the token is OK, then in, it creates a new endpoint, and it uh, spans, spawns uh, a new WSM Provost Web Services Management Provisioning Host, so WSM Provost Exe is the actual process running it. I want to show you what you can do with PS Remoting. Uh, so for example, in this case, I'm taking, first of all, uh, all the computer accounts that logged on to the domain in the last 90 days. Uh, that's not PowerShell Remoting yet. It's, it's just one liner in PowerShell. And uh, just expanding the, of course, the host names. So, so I'll get like four of them here. And what I can do with PowerShell Remoting, when I uh, combine it with jobs, Jobs is essentially uh, how it sounds. It's, it's background run spaces in memory, essentially uh, threads that are running uh, locally or remotely. And I'm just, just going to invoke command ICM to those four computers, and I'm going to run ipconfig slash all and just add the minus s job parameter. This means, my friends, uh, if you follow the logic, that uh, I am just going to get in a few seconds uh, ipconfig slash all output from all the machines in the domain. 
directly to my machine. And I remind you, you have to be locally there. So you have to connect with RDP or tools like that, you know, which takes a lot of time and you don't know that you've been breached. But now you can see the output. Of course, I can uh, just take it out uh, to a file. Uh, and, and that's really cool. So I, I have all the ipconfig slash all, the MAC addresses, DNS uh, settings, whatever that I want from all the machines in the domain into a single file, single buffer. And that's really, this is normal management experience that every uh, Windows admin should uh, experience, but, but they choose to work hard and uh, not to experience. It's their lives. Uh, so what you can do more with these sessions, this is really a, a very cool CLI uh, experience. You can actually copy to or from those sessions. I showed you already the casting of local variables. Uh, there are so many examples, but uh, in terms of uh, saving time, I'll just show you a few. For example, in this case, this remote server, LON DC1, uh, is uh, a blocked for, uh, port 445 is blocked, so there is no uh, file sharing. You can also see this uh, asynchronous connection to the port. Port 445 uh, is blocked, but still, I can create a new PowerShell session on port 5385, uh, 59, sorry, 85, and I can uh, just invoke commands to that session. In this case, I'm just going to do a, a quick ls or, or a quick dir to that uh, local temp directory on the remote server, and just going to show you, first of all, that I don't have any file there named test, right? I'm going to create on my local directory, on my machine, uh, create a, a new uh, file, just write uh, whatever I want in that file and just close it. And uh, as you can see, I have this file now locally at, on my machine. I want to copy it over to the other side. Keep in mind, there is no SMB open between the machines. So I'm going to copy it in a simple copy, but two session. There is a two session form session. I can also copy files from the other side. Uh, just pick the local path and now it has been copied. The destination is the folder on the remote server, right? Uh, and that's very simple to do because web services management, essentially, it reads uh, the, this uh, stream. It just does an HTTP request to the other side, and it's just uh, characters, right? So why not? So for the blue team, just enough access, or as it used to be just enough administration, allows you to do a secure, constrained, remote access command line. You can actually get uh, whatever you want to call it, role-based uh, access, whatever, you just have to use a CLI, okay? So if, if you're okay with typing stuff and you don't need a shiny GUI and you don't need right click, so uh, this will give you uh, this experience. And I am not able to go over all the features that you have here. I will just show you very briefly some of uh, the things you can do with the, this remote CLI. For example, I'm connecting to an interactive session. Entropy session is essentially, as you can see, I'm running commands now on the remote host. Lone CL1 is the remote host in this case. And you can see if I run get command, then I have close to 3,000 uh, commands available for me in that shell, which is quite a lot. And that's the default you will get on a PowerShell remote PS session. Uh, but I can also leverage uh, the power of uh, PowerShell uh, session configurations. And I'm going now to connect to the same machine, but to a configuration that I pre-created. I called it SecureCon. And uh, I uh, attached it to a user called Adam. So I'm just going to log on as that user, Adam. And you can see that the remote management experience for user Adam is totally different. First of all, no IP config, what, what the heck? And if I write correctly, shutdown exit, also no shutdown exit. So what do I have as user Adam managing this machine remotely? Aha, only those commands. Because I can actually whitelist not only functions, commands, I can go down to the parameter value level. For example, start service, only audio and spooler. This is all I allowed this user from the command start service. So no matter how much he tries hard to put other names of services, they are disallowed. And uh, to add on top of it, all the commands you're running on these sessions are logged and uh, audited. Uh, so you will see this connection in the event log. You will see all the transcript, all the input output of this session, the attempts to run IP config and, and, and that failed, all of this will be logged in the session. So once we see this cool technology, we want to use it. So we need to map or hunt, depends on the context, for those remote WS man sessions, right? And there are no tools outside of the box. Trust me, there are no. Because not no tools, because Microsoft, I don't know, it, it doesn't make money 
uh, to work uh, secure with good performance doesn't make money, but GUI make money, so you, there are tools. So uh, you have to write them. Uh, so for EDR and uh, Sysmo and things like that, you have to look for WSM Provost Exe. Again, I remind you, it's not PowerShell Exe. When you are running remote PowerShell sessions, the process that runs the show is WSM Provost Exe. It can actually be any process because uh, that's a topic uh, for a different talk. Uh, WinRM PowerShell operational logs. Those two logs will give you quite a lot of information about those connections. And you can also try uh, my Get Remote PS Session script. Uh, all of the code I'm showing you here, whether mine or, or others like the uh, Seth uh, shell script, etc., are up on GitHub, right? So um, you can see that it maps all the sessions. It shows you also when the session was last active and how long it has been idle. So you can see if it's uh, who is logged on from which IP and how long it, uh, it has been active. Let's speak a bit about... Uh, remote operations and credentialless exposure. So I'm not going to go over all of these items here, but you might be surprised when it comes to credentials being exposed, right? NTLM hashes, uh, Kerberos tickets, etc., in memory on remote hosts on the destination. You might be surprised by, by some of these examples. For example, PS exec, when you run with creds, that does expose, because it's an interactive uh, logon, like console logon at the end of the, end of the day, it creates uh, a service as well, etc. So you have credentials on the other machine and an adversary can uh, obviously take them, take control over them uh, and grab them from memory or whatever. Uh, remote schedule task as well, obviously run as a service. If it's uh, saved in a local uh, security authority in the SAM or on disk, Remote registry, however, interestingly enough, uh, is pure network connection, type 3. So many people, if you will ask them, they prefer to close a remote registry service, right? Big no-no, but they prefer to uh, uh, work with PSExec. Yeah, much more secure. Microsoft wrote it, Marko Zonovic. Uh, but you should just be aware of the truth and not of the adver advertisement. So let's get some advice from Microsoft. Microsoft knows best, right? Microsoft is the mummy of all this, uh, mama mum, of all these uh, tools. So we read the administrative tools, uh, uh, really a recent document. Uh, very cool. You can read and see. Uh, for example, let's take this example. I will not go all over them because I can and I did, but for time's sake. Uh, no reusable credentials on destination in a PowerShell WinRM session. And it is a network logon type 3 session, right? But is it like uh, IIS application pool or uh, no, no, not really, right? Let's think, let's think it over, right? And let's see how we can get actually a full working TGT without any Elsa secrets on the host. So I'm now uh, working from this host, Lone CL1. And if I look at all the, I enumerate all the uh, sessions for the username that hold all the processes, looking for unique users, no administrator, right? Adam system and some drivers. Now I'm going to, uh, I'm running as Adam, right? But I'm uh, going to run from a remote machine. I switch to a different machine. I'm going to enter a PowerShell remote session to that host we just were in, Lone CL1. And now I'm connected, as you can see, commands are running locally on that remote machine. So now I have a WinRM session uh, open. And now you can see I have, voila, I have a process with that administrator. And what does it mean that I have a process, a local process that runs the show? Maybe Mimikets can help me in a way. Uh, so I'm just going to run the usual Mimikets uh, order, get the uh, proper uh, privilege, uh, open a log file, easier for us to see what we get back, and secure LSA, log on passwords. We're going to dump uh, anything that we can get from that machine now that administrator is connected. And now I will show you how you write documentation in Microsoft. You look at the Mimikets, Nothing. And they are right. No credentials, guys. There, there is no uh, TGT, no NTLM, right? Even if we look, uh, we grab this uh, document, if we don't believe my uh, search skills, my control F search, you can also look at the tool. But we know we have a WSM Provost exe, uh, uh, process and it belongs to administrator. What if we just duplicate the token? Because the primary token belongs to that user. Although we don't have secrets, I'm just going to invoke uh, publicly available uh, invoke token manipulation and just create a CMD from the token of that process. And voila, 
I am administrator, but wait, this is just a process token. Will it work against the network? It does. <coughs> but wait, we have news. This side of the room, I saw your uh, faces. I don't like this face. Really smile, it's okay. Because there is a mitigation. Ta -da 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 -da. Virtual accounts. I tell you, Microsoft is not writing anything about this. Uh, you have to find this documentation, but you can actually run uh, what Microsoft calls Orana's virtual account for partial remote sessions, which means, uh, interestingly enough, it's a very cool uh, secure um, mitigation for this type of attacks because you can actually run on the partial session configuration, you can see Orana's virtual account equals true. So in the role capabilities file and the partial session configuration, you can ask to run as a virtual uh, user. What does this mean to run as a virtual user? This is very cool because now when we are going to connect, we're going to do the same trick and we are going to connect again to that uh, machine. Uh, this time I'm, I'm going to run as a user Adam, but that doesn't mean a thing because he's also uh, an elevated user, as you recall, uh, in the domain. And now I get a shell. Right, but this shell this time is running as you saw with the run as virtual account equals true. So this means uh, when we go back to our machine that now we see this uh, WSM provost, we see this user, we see this process, but look, the username is not Adam. This is WinRM virtual account. This means that what Microsoft is doing here, it's a beautiful mechanism. We do Kerberos authentication to the host and the process is spawn as a, a process that only belongs to the local machine. You don't have ability to create a, a handles to any other process outside the machine. Now I'm going to use Kernel Cactus, also research from uh, uh, one of our guys also at Tenroot, which is essentially a low level, uh, very uh, way more efficient token duplication. But you can see also with this Swiss Army knife, we got a process as WinRM, we don't have any Kerberos tickets, but when we try to access the domain controller, we get access denied. Why do we get access denied? The answer is in the Kerberos tickets. If we run Klist now, we see we did get Kerberos tickets from this attempt, but they all belong to the computer object, to computer account. Obviously, he cannot read the C dollar of... Uh, right, but wait, there is more. If we are an adversary and we already gained access to that server or by using Inve responder from the network, if we just edit this file, guys, it's uh, not uh, some uh, centralized uh, GPO or whatever. It's just a local text file. What if I edit this file and say, run as virtual account true, uh, dollar false? So, but wait. The blue team can say, aha, uh -huh, we can monitor for file and config changes and hash changes and can sign this uh, config file, right? And then this side of the room will say, this is our response when you're going to sign all config files, monitor them for changes, respond to them on the same. We uh, wish you good luck. But you, as you can see, this cat and mouse thing goes on and on. And uh, lastly, I want to show you how to prevent domain admins from logging on to endpoints. It sounds like a simple task. Uh, it can be. Uh, normally, and there are great third-party tools to do that. But actually, in order to stop lateral movement, you can always go for uh, some uh, big uh, uh, tools. But uh, to be honest, if you know how Active Directory works, uh, and you know it has this little feature called user workstations, logon workstations, you can actually use them. So one small step for IT, Imagine an environment you have no EDR, no segmentation, no firewall rules, nothing, no MFA, no nothing, and yet you want to prevent lateral movement. So let's see if a simple uh, user configuration uh, can do this trick. So I have this user, Adam, which is a privileged user, uh, and this user, by default, like any other user in Windows, has logon workstation set to all computers. So essentially, there is a centralized configuration in Microsoft Active Directory that allows you to limit the uh, hosts that the user can log on to. As simple as that. Obviously, in a real-world example, you won't limit it to just the domain controller, but to another uh, uh, privileged access workstation on jump server or whatever. Now we're going to do, uh, from this machine, we're going to do pass the hash. So I'm going to pass the hash as user Adam. 
And pass the hash, the way it works, obviously, is, as, as you might know, that the impersonation token, the secondary token, is using the hash, right? The primary token belongs to the local user. And now we're going to run a bunch of uh, uh, commands, uh, some lateral movements, this and that. You can see they will all fail. I try to do a dir to the DC, even to sysvol, and it fails, right? I will try to do a WMI query to that domain controller, and it also fails. Access denied, it says, but it's the access is not denied. It's uh, just that uh, you are not allowed to log on from any machine other than that server. Uh, then we can go ahead to more and more examples. Partial remoting will say user or password incorrect, but trust me, you will get second thoughts about your pass the hash. The hash is correct. All these messages are there deliberately to prevent you from understanding the real problem. PSExec tells you the real problem. The user isn't allowed to sign in, in this, into this computer. This meaning the client that is trying to access, only to the remote server. But the beauty of this very simple living off the land uh, blue team technique is that once you run this, you set that, then the user, no matter what, schedule task, service, uh, WMI subscription, application pool, whatever, doesn't matter where, interactive or not interactive, he will not be able to perform a successful authentication anywhere in the network. I want to show you how, uh, how deep this goes, uh, that even if I do an LDAP bind, which is essentially, you know, in Active Directory we have uh, Kerberos, MTLM, and LDAP, three authentication protocols. LDAP is an authentication protocol, not, not just application protocol, to those that were not sure. And I'm just going to run an LDAP query, not more than that, in an LDAP bind. So I have an LDAP connection that I created, and even the LDAP query fails. I get exception, supplies credential invalid, right? So I'm just going to leave this session, this machine, as is, right? I'm, I'm not going to touch it at all. And just go uh, back. Um, ah, yeah, yeah. And also, I want to show you that from RDP as well as PSExec, you will also get uh, the same error, right? Uh, it will actually tell you what is wrong with this session. But this is, of course, not uh, with pass the hash. Even if you know the password, you will get this uh, very clear message that uh, there is a problem that uh, you are limited to login only from specific machines. So what can we do? If, if we go back to the domain controller, uh, and uh, just to show you that this, this is really the, the issue, the this configuration, if we go back to the domain controller, we flip back, or we add, the, either we add this machine as a jump server, as a privileged, a privileged access workstation, or we can just give it, uh, you know, a permission to log on back to all computers, then everything we've done in the past will work. Boom. LDAP immediately works. Right? Everything we will now run, uh, if we're trying to do a remote schedule task, boom. Works. Everything works. So we had permissions all the time. Password was okay. Hash was okay. I'm not going to talk, because we don't have time, go over all this for you. But please do check uh, my GitHub page, also for options to monitor this uh, change. So key takeaways. Please, please embrace the living of the land mentality. For both red teamers, we know it works. For blue teamers, try to work living of the land also for the blue team. It really helps a lot. Uh, note that credentials exposure on uh, remote operations might not be how the documentation tells you. You have to sometimes do some research about that. Uh, and as you saw, sometimes a simple configuration, small living of the land configuration in existing systems can do more than uh, third-party tools that uh, uh, cost quite a lot. Keep in mind that partial remoting, although it's awesome, it rocks, and it's uh, the only way to manage uh, a Windows environment, and it's open source, it runs also on Windows and Mac, and Azure Cloud Shell, and whatever, uh, by default, no security uh, features are enabled for PowerShell. You have to properly configure them. There is also research of uh, me and my team with Omer Yair and the team in Javelin. We are released in VisiShell, still up on GitHub, which works until today. It's total bypass of all PowerShell uh, protection, all PowerShell blue team. Sorry. But we talked about Microsoft before we released it, obviously, and we settled on a COM object. Uh, yeah. Uh, the original research was not approved. So, because it's too much. But uh, you can check my GitHub for tools and code. And remember, everything in life is a set of nested if statements. Even ChatGPT. <laughs> Thank you,